Okay. Namaho Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhuhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nati Namine Thank 
left without those guys, I would have sounded like a frog, but they, they drowned me out, so it sounded good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was asked to speak on uh, Srila Prabhupada, the ideal Grihasta. So this is a little something that I had never spoken on before, but with a little bit of thought, I was tr trying to come up with some ideas of how Prabhupada lived in Grihasta life in the ideal way. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Yamaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stavditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Om Namah Shivaya 
Krishna Prasnaya Bhutale, Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gaudavani Pachari Nindir Vishesha Sunyavadi, Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Yeah, with His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, the founder of Chari of the Hare Krishna movement, met his spiritual master in 1922, <clears throat> and that's a very momentous occasion, which has been documented in detail. At that time, he was married and for about a couple of years, and he had only had one child, one young boy. His first child's name was Vrindavan. After meeting Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati on the rooftop of Uttadanga Junction Road, the place is still there. Actually, just last year, the devotees in ISKCON secured that place, and now we have it as a landmark memory of Srila Prabhupada first meeting Bhakti Siddhanta. So that was a great achievement to get that place after decades trying to get it. But we finally secured it, and that was the beginning of Srila Prabhupada's uh, connection with his spiritual master, which later led to what we have today is the entire Iskand society worldwide. And Prabhupada, when he met his spiritual master, it changed his whole way of life. Now he understood the importance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement before he was a Gandhian and had protested the intervention of British rule in India. And therefore, he was very active in that. Later on, of course, he gave up that and became more or less engaged in worldly affairs. And then, of course, he had a business, which was, he was not the main person, Dr. Chandra, uh, or Jagadish Chandra Bose, who was the head of Bose's pharmaceutical laboratories. Uh, Prabhupada had some uh, knowledge of medicine and chemistry and later became a pharmacist. And then, after only working a couple of years, he met his spiritual master. <clears throat> and then that changed his whole life. He decided that he wanted to support the devotees of Bhakti Siddhanta by doing something. So in his place in Allahabad in India, he opened up a little preaching center, and then the devotees would come and give classes. And Prabhupada left, he used to love to lead the kirtans. <laughs> Even, we, we sometimes we connect Prabhupada a lot with his, uh, his, vach, his vakya, his words. But he used to love the lead kirtans. <laughs> and he was very good at playing the murdanga. And he taught devotees how to play the murdanga. Of course, we play a little different now. <laughs> we have added a few beats to the Prabhupada's original tini tini ta ta ta, tini tini ta ta ta. <laughs> so, He's added a few. But Prabhupada, you know, he was... And of course, Prabhupada did so many bhajans, but he loved to, to do kirtan. And uh, so when the devotees were coming, one sannyasi, one brahmachari, and others would come to his place, and they, he would arrange for people to come, and they would... And so his interest in uh, the whole society of his spiritual master started to grow. And of course, at that time, his family was also growing, and his business was also increasing. He was becoming more and more expert as his business, so much so that his employer, or the owner of the business, Dr. Bose, gave him responsibilities to take care of the business, and at the same time, he opened up another pharmaceutical plant in another place and made Srila Prabhupada. His name was Abhay Charan at the time. He made him the head of that particular section. And of course, Prabhupada even created his own toothpaste. I don't know if you know Prabhupada toothpaste. <laughs> we have it. <laughs> we used to call it Prabhupada toothpaste. <laughs> it's a combination of uh, 
I can't remember all the ingredients. There's one devotee in America who sells it. <laughs> it's called Prabhupada's toothpaste. <laughs> and it's just like salt and some kind of uh, neem and a few other ingredients. Quite nice. You brush your teeth, you become Krishna conscious. <laughs> And Prabhupada's way of spreading Krishna consciousness through through uh, <laughs> dental <laughs> care. <laughs> so that was Prabhupada. And, uh, but the thing is, as his life was, in spiritual life was becoming more and more an interest to him, you know, he also found it very difficult to maintain family and at the same time to keep his business going. It was just a natural drawing towards the spiritual. And uh, not that he neglected his material duties. He was a dutiful householder. He had a nice wife. Her name was Radharani Datta. Uh, his father arranged for that marriage. He wanted to marry another girl, but Prabhupada's, his father said, no, you marry this one, because the other girl was too good looking. <laughs> and that was, now he said, because she's too good looking, you wouldn't be able to give up household life so easy. So you should marry this one. She's not as good looking. So <laughs> that was some strategic <laughs> tactic, anyway. So he agreed. He followed his father, and of course she was a very nice wife. And Prabhupada had five children. He had five children. He had three boys and two girls, actually. But Prabhupada and he had a business very successful, but he found it difficult to. And he didn't have enough, what we say, uh, resources to maintain his family at the same time, carry on his business, and at the same time practice spiritual life. So more and more, his life in spiritual circles and his attraction to the Gaudiya Math, his spiritual masters, started to increase more and more and more. And at one point, uh, his business started to take a, a downslide. Actually. It was, it was destined by his astrologers that if he would have stayed in business, he would have been one of the richest persons in all of India. <laughs> wow. And people in India are really, really rich. I mean, you got such a dichotomy that the, that the space in between is unbelievably big. You have people that are so rich uh, that they're billionaires by, by you know, Western standards, but at the same time we see the other side. People there's hard. People hardly have nothing. So Prabhupada was destined, in that in the material sense, to be very wealthy and have success in in all areas of life. But because of his attraction to Krishna consciousness, he found himself not able to keep up his material responsibilities in the way that would have been a man who was very much progressing, successful, you know, developing. So at one point, you know, he started to uh, spend more and more time there. And his family was feeling a little neglected. <laughs> uh, but Prabhupada tried to balance that out, but it was very difficult because his heart was drawn more and more to Krishna consciousness. His wife, she, I mean, he, she had one very bad habit. Oh, it was terrible. She liked to drink tea. That's a great sin. <laughs> Compared to nowadays. <laughs> so that was her only vice. She liked to drink tea and, and she would spend whatever money she could on tea biscuits. Because, <laughs> you know, this was the inter this was uh, the, the, uh, the British intervention into English, India. At four o'clock in the afternoon, everything, everybody would stop and they would have tea and tea biscuits. Mm -hmm. And tea biscuits was a big business in those days. <laughs> and so one time, because they didn't have much money, uh, she wanted some tea biscuits. So Prabhupada had his copy of Srimad Bhagavatam that he would read regularly. So one day he came home, and uh, he uh, was looking for his Bhagavatam. 
He couldn't find it, so he asked his wife, did you see my Bhagavatam? She said, oh, yes, I wanted some tea biscuits, so I traded your Bhagavatam in for the tea biscuits. <laughs> and Prabhupada was just like, because all the while he was trying to bring her along, but she was not coming along. <laughs> She was a nice lady, very dutiful mother and housewife, so many things, but she wasn't so interested in his spiritual side. So he said to her, when he realized what she had done with his Bhagavatam, he said, tea or me? <laughs> and she said, tea. <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> And then he thought, hmm, here's a chance to end his household life. <laughs> so gradually after that, things started to dwindle and he started moving away from household life. Although he tried to take care of his family in a less direct way, he found himself being more and more drawn to Krishna consciousness. And as, a, as his spiritual master society was growing, because Bhakti Siddhanta was preaching all over India, he had made 60 sannyasis and they have been traveling all the way down, all the way from the top of India to the bottom, preaching and establishing many, many programs and many, many temples. Uh, so he was drawn into more and more Krishna conscious activities. And therefore he wasn't spending so much time with the family. And the business became less and less and less. At one point he retired from his business also. His uh, boss didn't like that, said, you know, I'll, I'll give you a raise in salary. In fact, I'll double your salary <laughs> and give you less hours. Just stay with the business, because he was so expert at his business. So here, he had a good family, average family, good in that sense. Expert in business, but his spiritual life was becoming his, his main, main absorption. And so gradually, gradually, he started to put some of the sons in charge of the family. His older son Vrindavan, he had a middle son named Prayag, and another younger son named Mathura. And of course, um, and then gradually, 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 he uh, moved into Krishna conscious more and more, where at one point, he, it was obvious that whatever he had in the past was no longer important to him, so he just and gradually, of course, at one time Bhakti Siddhanta, after he had disappeared, he came to Prabhupada in a dream and said, you should take a sannyas. Oh, 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 sannyas. Whoa. He wasn't ready for that. He went to his god brother in the middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning, came to Sridhar Swami, one of his senior god brothers. He said, Guru Maharaj is appearing in my dreaming, tell, taking me, telling me to take sannyas. How can I do that? <laughs> and then, you know, he was trying to pacify him. And then he had a second dream, same thing. Second time, Bhakti Siddhanta told him, take sannyas. And Prabhupada said, I was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> My spiritual master is calling me, take sannyas. And so eventually, in 1959, he finally took sannyas. And later on, when he was in the, when he was in, in Iskan, he was saying, you know, I had, uh, <laughs> you're not going to like this, anyway, <laughs> he said, you know, I was living in my family, I had a wife and so many children, now I'm, in, I'm a sannyasi, I have 300 children and with no botheration of wife. <laughs> <laughs> so Krishna has provided so many children, because, you know, the sannyasi, the guru is like his disciples. They're like they're like children. It's it's treated the same way. A spiritual master is seen as the father of their disciples, and so the father loves the disciples, and the disciples love the spiritual master just as they would love a father or a parent. That's the actual relationship. And so Prabhupada eventually moved away from that, but. Even after he left, he made sure that his family, Jai Panchatattva Ki Jai. He made sure that his family got what they needed to take care 
So sometimes he would send money through his elder son later on when he came to America and then when he had some money. He was always concerned that they were taken care of nicely. So, but ultimately, and he's also teaching us that at one stage in life, one has to move into the, an area of complete, uh, what we say, renunciation of all material fails and focus fully on Krishna. It's not just for men, it's for everyone. Because the whole goal of life is to become Krishna conscious. So we go through different stages. And at one point we become married and we have family and the children grow up and they get their positions in society, they have their own family. Then gradually the, the relationship between husband and wife becomes more of a friend. And then gradually that all still starts to diminish. And then one moves away from that and then ultimately focuses fully on their spiritual life. For ladies, they usually go to holy places and live there and serve the deity in the holy places, and that is called sannyas for women, generally. They don't take the formal sannyas with the danda like that, but they actually take the renounced mood by putting on white and living in holy places and serving the Lord in his deity form to the end of their life. And pretty much if they do that in full devotion, they're guaranteed to go back to the spiritual world. So this is the, because life is lived in stages. We see that even now. We live in, when we're young, we live in a certain way. As we get older, we, our values and our directions in life become less, or I mean, changed, and we move in. A, and so even, so in the later part of life, we see the, the idea of cutting away from all the responsibilities that keep us connected to the material existence and focus completely on devotional life. So Prabhupada was an ideal Krihasta in that sense that he kept his responsibilities and also even when he left the family he made sure that the family was getting what they needed to take care of their responsibilities as much as he could, as much as he could. So Prabhupada did that even with the ISKCON society he also, when he, before he left, he also wanted to make sure that our ISKCON society was carrying on according to the disciplic succession as was started by, his, his, by, by Krishna himself. And therefore he put in place um, some of his leading uh, disciples to take on the responsibility of initiating others. In 1974, um, one devotee, his name was Tushta Krishna. Later, he became Tushta Krishna. No, uh, was it Tushta Krishna? Yeah, and there was a Pushta Krishna, and there was a Tushta Krishna. Tushta Krishna, and he he wrote a letter to Prabhupada about you know do disciples you know when do they become qualified take on responsibility of a spiritual master. He says, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message. He said he wants everyone to become spiritual master. By my command, be guru, save the land. He said that to the Korma Brahma when Lord Chaitanya was passing. So he gave that order to everyone. Everyone would take on responsibility to become a spiritual master. But there are some who actually take on the responsibility according to the principles of disciplic succession. So Prabhupada wrote back to Tusta Krishna, it's not the it's the etiquette of the disciple to get to take on the responsibility of preaching Krishna consciousness. And may some may come forward and take the position of guru to carry on the disciplic succession, but not until or not in the presence of their own spiritual master. So Prabhupada trained a lot of the, his, his followers to take up the responsibilities of keeping the disciplic succession alive. You see in our, in our Krishna consciousness movement where it's unique, where you see in the disciplic succession there is one particular prominent guru, and it comes right down the line. But because ISKCON is a historical phenomenon, <laughs> in the sense that there's never been a movement like this anywhere. In the sense that we are all over the world. 
usually the guru and the disciple are in one place. But because we have a worldwide movement, it's not possible to take care of disciples. So there are many spiritual masters. And what is the qualification of a spiritual master? Well, that's mentioned in the, uh, in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Tasma Guru Papadyeta Jigyasa Sri Uttamam Sabde Parechena Nishnatman Brahma Upasraya Sriyam. This is that verse that gives the qualification. One who knows fully the Vedas, can speak the Vedas, can defeat any opposing arguments that are against Vedic conclusions, and they come in the cyclic succession from the previous acharyas like that. So some type of people say, well, Prabhupada was the last guru, but actually no, that means that's the end of the cyclic succession. But Prabhupada empowered, he gave the empowerment, he also gave the direction, and he also gave the knowledge, which was the empowerment, in order to carry on the Krishna conscious movement. So Prabhupada said, I want many gurus. When someone asked Srila Prabhupada, can a woman become a guru? Prabhupada said, we have our Janava Devi. She was the wife, of course, of Lord Nityananda. And during the Ketari Gram festival in India, after Lord Chaitanya, she was the leading person in the entire assembly. And there was Srinivas Acharya, there was Naratam Das Thakur, Ramachandra Kaviraj, many, many of the great associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who were still living. But she was considered to be the most exalted of all the Vaishnavas in every part of India at the time. And there were Vaishnavas in Navadvip, there were in Jagannath Puri and in Brahman Vrindavan and in other places. So Prabhupada's, um, Prabhupada's legacy is that he wanted us to carry on this disciplic succession. And therefore he put so much emphasis on training devotees so they could take up the responsibility of becoming guru. And so, but anybody who thinks they're a guru is a guru. You know what a guru is? Ah, it's a cow. <laughs> Was that okay? <laughs> well, I think I do better. I, I, I have a little sore throat, so it's, it's not a good cow. <laughs> but the idea is, no, one does not identify themselves with the position they play. Just like I could say to you, are you a woman? Yes? No. You've got a woman's body. You're a spiritual being who has a body of a woman. That's all. That's the reality. Of course, when we identify with our material, you know, labels, we say, well, I'm a woman, I'm young, I'm old, I'm happy, I'm hungry, you know, so many different things we say, but these are all external. Our identity is Jivar Sudupai Krishna Nitya Das. Every living entity is the same. Every living entity is part and parcel of Krishna, and every living entity has an eternal loving relationship with Krishna. That doesn't change. So, man, your bodies have nothing to do with that relationship, with that, with that identity, with that identity. So Prabhupada knew that I've created a worldwide society, how to keep it going. So therefore he instructed devotees who were his senior devotees to take up the responsibilities of carrying on a disciplic succession, and he empowered 11 personalities at the time to take on that responsibility to keep the disciplic succession going. And so on behalf of Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada is the founder of Acharya, that is that he is what is called the ultimate principle of how the society works. He's, his knowledge, his direction, his instructions, his books, Everything that he did to make this society and develop it and to propagate it is all centered around Srila Prabhupada. So those who come in the line of disciplic succession, who have their own disciples also, 
they connect everyone to Srila Prabhupada. Not that they have, they're independent. And so each of the gurus in the ISKCON society have their own disciples. But it's like, it's like a family where there are many uncles and cousins like that. So we have so many fathers, we have so many uncles, we have so many cousins, we have so many nephews and nieces like that. That's how Prabhupada organized the society. And so he knew that the society could not go on in a, what we call the way that was designed unless he had some disciples who could take on the responsibilities of Guru and make disciples all over the world. And when Prabhupada was asked, well, once we make disciples, this is just before he left, will they be your guru, your disciple? He said, no, they'll be your disciple. You're the one, you're their, their guru, you'll be your disciple. I am their like param guru. That means grand disciple or like grandfather disciple and that a grandfather spiritual master like that. So Prabhupada was very responsible we can see it, the connection to his household life, how when he left that, he made sure everything was going on nicely. And at the same time, when he left this society, he put everything in place so that society could go on in the same way. And we were seeing, we're actually seeing that. We're seeing that. Our society has only grown. Prabhupada was a little concerned after he, just before he left. He said, you may not be able to increase it, but don't destroy it. <laughs> He said that to us. <laughs> keep, keep going what I established. But it's amazing because now when Prabhupada was here, we had you know, a couple of hundred temples maybe at the most. And now we have, you know, I don't know how many temples around the world. 600 temples, farm communities, gurukuls, schools, restaurants, preaching centers, and then the society has expanded by the mercy of Prabhupada because he empowered his leading disciples to preach all over the world and take on responsibility of becoming spiritual master and empowering those devotees who have become his, what we say, nephews and nieces, their disciples, to preach Krishna consciousness. Now you can see, because that didn't happen when, Shila, when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati left. And Prabhupada was concerned that he would have the same problem when he left. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, just before he left, he told his leading disciples to establish a governing body commission to manage this society. And uh, they didn't do it. And after he left, they were starting to fight. Well, I'm the guru. No, I'm the guru. And Prabhupada said they were fighting in court for hundreds, not hundreds, but three or four decades. Even when Prabhupada was here, that the court cases were still going on. Who's the actual legacy or the main guru in Bhakti Siddhanta's line? So that was never really. And finally, the, the, the courts threw it out of court and it became something unfinished. But Prabhupada established a governing body commission with the managing society, but at the same time, he empowered his leading disciples to take on responsibilities of becoming full spiritual masters. And uh, because of that, Prabhupada was a good manager. Oh, he was a good manager. <laughs> Sometimes you have a powerful spiritual person, but they can't manage. <laughs> and sometimes you have great managers, and they have a hard time with their japa. <laughs> so, but Prabhupada was, he was an expert manager, so expert. And so how he managed this society was so amazing. Just like one time the devotees wanted to centralize everything, put everything in one area and make that just like a very, they say we got to, people all over, we just centralize it and that way we can boil the milk and make devotees more powerful, our movement more powerful. said don't centralize everything. Keep every t temple independently uh, functioning. But we work together as a group and we all have our own individual temple. And that saved our whole movement. Uh, there wouldn't be any movement if we would have centralized that. 
because in America there were court cases and they wanted to sue ISKCON, but they couldn't because there was no ISKCON entity. Every temple was separate. <laughs> so they had, to take, they had to sue every temple independently. And because they tried, and they managed to took, take a few temples and put them on in court cases, and some of the court cases we won, but if they would have made it an entity and they would have won, the whole society could have been bankrupt and destroyed. But Prabhupada's managing for foresight saved his whole society. And so sometimes people say, well, Prabhupada didn't bring any persons to m carry on his legacy. That's not true. Because the disciplic succession means gurus, disciples, they be, one of the disciples becomes guru and then there's more disciples. And this way it carries on decade after decade with gurus and disciples like that. But within the ISKCON society, Prabhupada has a unique position. He's called the founder Acharya. No one can take his position. His position is unique because he has established how this society goes on in terms of the philosophy and the practice and like that. So I just wanted to point out Prabhupada's expertise <laughs> and how he did everything in the most amazing way. And at the same time, traveling around the world and preaching, giving classes, or translating books, dealing with the, you know, organizational problems, individual problems, so many things. It was amazing what Prabhupada did. But he left nothing uncovered. He said, only one thing is left that I haven't done. He said, this is my regret. We haven't established Van Ashram system. He wanted Van Ashram. What did he mean by Van Ashram? He wanted to establish these rural communities. He said, this society, this material society will collapse. We're seeing it. <laughs> right in the middle of some collapse right now. He said, it will not go on. We have to establish self-sufficiency where we have our own communities. We can develop our own food, grow vegetables, keep cows, grow grains, and live according to what we say, natural living, and not dependent on factories and cinemas and bars and nightclubs and tea shops and whatever else we got out there. <laughs> So Prabhupada, he said that's the only thing he didn't establish was this fund. So this is what we have to work on. Establishing this next phase of Prabhupada's movement, these natural farm communities. Uh, and it doesn't have to be so much of a farm, but it should be rural. Because Prabhupada said these cities, they won't last, they'll collapse. You know? They're already collapsing. <laughs> How long can it go on? Because collapse is not some mismanagement of some social, political, or economic affairs. Because that's what they think. When things go wrong, they try to adjust the economy, they try to adjust the social principles. Collapse is moral turpitude. When morality goes down, everything goes. And nowadays, what is morality? Whatever you want to do, that is okay, right? Morality is self-defined. Yeah. Your country's pretty good. Go to America. It's hell. <laughs> hell. It is hell. Nobody, everybody does what they want in the name of freedom of expression. That's like that. And so, four regulative principles, everybody follows them, but they all, they all follow them. They make sure there's a lot of illicit sex, they make sure there's a lot of intoxication, there's a lot of meat-eating, a lot of gambling, and a lot of other stuff that falls into these categories. So when morality goes, everything goes. And Krishna, and then what happens? The earth withdraws and starts punishing people for their sinful activities, and what you have? Coronavirus. <laughs> it's in the Bhagavatam. Look it up. Seventh canto, 15th chapter, verse number 24, Prabhupada says, due to sinful activities, pestilence and wars come. This is the reaction to sinful activity. So the world is pretty much pretty degraded. It's very degraded. 
you're lucky. You, you, your country is lucky you were communist for a while. <laughs> That's, that was your good fortune. You were blocked from all this, what we say, corruption and degradation. But now it's filtering in. <laughs> It's coming everywhere like that. So you're a little bit behind the rest of the degradation, but it'll catch up. <laughs> it's just the way it is. And so as that increases, then Mother Nature does two things. She provides and she punishes. When you follow the laws of God, she gives. When, she, when you don't, she withholds and punishes depending on the severity of it. So that's what's happening now. Mother Nature is reacting to the sinful activities, the collective sinful activities of the planet. So these farm communities are actually the future of the world. And Prabhupada wanted to establish these things. He said, keep the temples in the cities for preaching, live on the farms. He said, you'll have more time for chanting Hare Krishna, and you you know everything is much more what we say natural and normal you can breathe out there <laughs> you know you heard of the thing called air <laughs> it's becoming less the more the, the more pollution the less the amount of oxygen in the air and the more people get sick you need if you go there's one thing good about your country there's many good things, good things i noticed <laughs> One thing good, people like to go outdoors here, right? And they're in the mountains, they're on the seashore, they're always doing like that. People are healthy here, and that's good. I mean, living in the cities and, you know, with smog and noise and pollution and whatever else you got to go on, is you know, noisy neighbors. There's so many things, it's just, it just causes the, the living entity to you know, fight to exist, health-wise, aesthetic-wise, moral-wise, spiritual-wise. So, Prabhupada had a vi no, Prabhupada's vision was wide. He had a vision for a complete change in the whole world, making everything simple and spiritual. That was his whole idea. That was his Prabhupada. So, he established, you know, the future of our movement through his legacy of empowering his leading disciples to take on his the same thing he was doing preaching making disciples and uh, and writing books too he said all every sannyasi has to write <laughs> he said that. all the sannyasis have to write and everybody else can write too Nowadays, it's not hard to write a book, right? Anybody can write a book. Pick a topic, just do some research. Anything on spiritual life, you can write a book and people will read it. So writing is good. We want more and more books. Prabhupada said, this is our tradition. I write and you write books about my books. And then we write more and more books. And we flood the world with transcendental literature. The thing is, you can't, you have to somehow counteract the negativity with the positive. So we want to just flood the world with Krishna consciousness. And then people will start to understand how you can actually really be happy. Krishna consciousness is the perfect position for eternal happiness. and healthy living. <laughs> Any questions? Comments? Oh yes, uh, Mangala Ch Chandrika? No. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. You mentioned how when children grow up in old age that uh, one should dedicate his or her life to Krishna consciousness more. And we hear this more t many times. And um, I was reflecting how actually when we get older, 
it seems we have more challenges because you know our body gets older and we're less tolerant and you know there's just bodily wise material wise it's more challenging um, to absorb oneself mm. and I was meditating how basically this tendency to I mean this uh, Prabhupada's instruction to live simply and think well, high. Pra Prabhupada wanted to establish these communities around the world where devotees can and it's not like your family is the only one that's going to take care of you. We see, and this is how we run our society, that each devotee sees each other as family members. And so, devotees caring for devotees. That's part of the whole, what we say, social development of our society. Just like, you know, I was in, I was in London one day and I was eating breakfast. And so I bit into a, an almond, and I broke my tooth. And I was thinking, oh no. All right, oh, Krishna Katai. No, Krishna, no, Krishna Kirta. Yeah, he's my friend, he's a dentist. So I called him up, and I said, I broke my tooth. He said, can you come in today at 2 o'clock? I said, yeah. Okay. So I had my tooth fixed. <laughs> Same day. So, you know, he's not a relative. I didn't pay anything. <laughs> we get sick, you know, we have doctors too. You know, if I get sick, I call up my, my overall doctor in London, Sundarananda, I said, and he refers me to other doctors and they give me advice. I have my doctor in, in India, he's an Ayurvedic physician. He's one of the top Ayurvedic physicians in India. I just ask him, this is my problem. What's this medicine? All right, you do this. And he gives me the formula, sends me everything, tells me what to buy. Yeah. So we have a society where we have so much talent. If we all organize that talent and ability, nobody has to go outside to any kind of what we say materialistic person to get whatever we need. It's all here. So even taking care of elderly, it's there. We, we set up, just like where we have this gentleman here, well, Bhavananda I think is now. He's here. He's just in a restaurant over there. Devotees are there with him all the time. He's elderly. He needs some personal care. Hmm. So we do that. It's not that our family members are our own, our only hope when we get old. <laughs> you know, they're there also, but we have a whole society. <laughs> it's like one devotee, he, uh, something happened to him, I think. He's a good friend of mine, he was in London. And he's from Australia. So, I forgot what he got. He got some real bad illness. So he has health insurance in, in Australia. But he was in London and he couldn't travel because of his health. They said if he went on a plane he would probably die. So he couldn't take advantage of health insurance. So what happened? The devotees put on the net. This devotee needs money. Within a, within a couple of weeks they raised $10,000. <laughs> Yeah, and I can name so many devotees. Yeah. Yeah, Indra Dumna Maharaj, anytime he finds a devotee who gets sick, he goes on this thing and he puts it out. Come on, we need some money for this devotee. He's always helping devotees. So we have, we have, a, whole, we have a system, it's not fully put in place, where devotees can get anything they need at any time in any part of the world. It just needs to be expanded. Like that. So we don't have to worry when we get old. You might say, well, you're a sannyasi, that's a little different. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, we, we do that for everyone, no matter who they are. If they're a devotee, we try to take care of them in whatever way we can. Because devotees are special. So I don't think there's any worry. <laughs> And you know what? Devotees like to help devotees. 
they actually enjoy it? <laughs> In fact, tell me something that you need and I'll try to help you. <laughs> Devotees even say that. Can I do something for you? Well, no. <laughs> but if you need something, just let me know. Just like in, in India, in the Chaupati system under Radhana Swami, if they, the people don't even have a job, they have, they have people to help them get jobs. They need doctors, that's, that's taken care of. They need marriage counseling, that's taken care of. They need, a boy wants to find a girl, a girl wants to find a boy, they have a system where they put their names in and they arrange devotees to meet together and develop relationships. So that's, that's, this is our society. It's developing in that way. It's not all around the world yet. But that's, that is the, what we want to do because Prabhupada said, and it's true, this society will not be able to maintain. You know. Someday, you know, the whole thing, you, you know, the water could be cut off, the gas could be cut off, you know. If the whole, if the, the, the whole thing fails, if you depend on this society, then you're going to have problems. <laughs> so Prabhupada wanted this, what we say, a society within the society, where we can be insular and take care of devotees. And also people from the outside, if they came, they could also get what they needed. The only problem is it's not 100% yet. We're still working on it. But there's, the GBC has set up a devotee care, uh, what is it, devotee care, what is it called? Fe it's a feature of the GBC, a whole devotee care committee. Yeah, it's a committee of leading devotees who work only on caring for devotees. That's all they do, that's their, ser that's their service. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. It was okay? Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking probably it also makes sense to start being absorbed in Krishna consciousness earlier <laughs> rather than wait until we are... <laughs> yeah, Prahlad Maharaj gives that instruction. From the very beginning of childhood, one should practice Krishna consciousness. There's a story with one, uh, one uh, Greek... Uh, educator. His name is Diogenes. So one lady, she came to Diogenes and she said, my dear Diogenes, uh, I have a son and I want to bring him to you for education. Diogenes says, how old is the boy? And she said, he's five. He said, bring him immediately. We're already five years too late. <laughs> Komara Arvajati Prabhya Dharma Bhagata Hiha. You know, education starts within the womb. <laughs> yeah. You see, look at these these two good two gentlemen here. From the very beginning. Yeah, look at them. Ideal devotees. <laughs> very gentlemanly like. They know they like Krishna consciousness. They're respectful to everybody. They, they have many good qualities. Their parents brought them up from the very beginning. This is Krishna consciousness. There's many like that. There's the other one. She's smiling brightly. I told her, you're not from this world. Where'd you come from? <laughs> from another planet, high planet. <laughs> So yeah, you know, this is a responsibility of parents to raise their children and give them Krishna consciousness. And if they do that, that is the complete duty of a parent. When they do that, their life has become successful. They have fulfilled the role of mother and father perfectly. So yeah, that's what we're teaching, that if you're going to have children, Make sure you can educate them and take care of them at the same time. <laughs> yeah, so we need to work on it yet. I'm not saying we have it on the social level, it's not complete, but it's something that is in the process. 
We're still developing that. So you might think, how can we do it here in Slovenia? <laughs> more and more. Bradesh, it's pretty good there, right? <laughs> they, they're doing it, right? Not Gurukul, but Sunday school. But that's something. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was another question I saw somewhere. Where was that other question? Oh, she left? <laughs> oh, take care of the kids. Okay. <laughs> okay, so should we stop here? Okay, thank you very much. Shri Ma Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah.